Anjuta Gusakova. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Bettina, I'm the board chair of the Craft Council, and um, this talk and the exhibition is part of Craft in Vancouver, which is a month-long event, and um, there's a million things happening. So there's a, a brochure that you can pick up, a catalog book at the Craft Council, or you can go online and look up Craft in Vancouver. But the Craft Council has openings and talks and all kinds of events all year round, so um, you can keep track of us at our website too. So I'm pleased to welcome Anuta. Thank you. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. Is it okay that I'm sitting oh, okay, in front yes, of you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Uh, so I'm very happy to see that it's not just my mom and my boyfriend. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to first of all thank uh, Craft Council of BC for giving me such an opportunity. It's such a. I've been um, collaborating with them for a couple years now. Um, selling through their gallery and uh, now I have a solo show in their little cute super cute gallery space so it's very nice there and the work is very high level everything so I just love that place so thank you very much again and um, um, and special thank you for the person without whom that won't be possible like at all that's my mom, <laughs> Olga. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and of course, my bo boyfriend, Dan, because without him, I cannot move, lift, transport, install. <laughs> it's like absolutely. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Dan. Now I'm going to entertain you for a while. <laughs> uh, if, and also, uh, if you feel like you want to ask something right now about something you, you see, so don't wait till the end because then you'll forget. So if, even if it's a dialogue and you ask something and they answer, I find that this would be a nice uh, format. So you're welcome to just speak out if you have anything to say or ask. So that's... Um, okay, let's start. <laughs> that's my logo, by the way. In the middle, yeah. I first uh, created those round letters because I thought they fit in all my round things. And then I thought it needs some sort of a crown. And then this little bear head be became like a crown. So that's my stamp. If you see it on any piece, that's like, I made it. And it starts uh, in 1974, back in the Soviet Union. That's where I was born. And all my childhood um, was a Soviet childhood, which was a little different from even like modern Russia. Mm -hmm. So, and it started even before me, it started like around 1900s, where my ancestors from both sides, my father and my mother's, they all came from the European part, from like around Moscow, in Ukraine and um, other areas that always like shifted uh, citizenship from like Poland to Russia, Prussia, Ukraine, everything. And then they moved all the way through um, Tsarist Russia to the very far east, to the Pacific. And that's where Vladivostok was formed like less than 200 years ago. And uh, some of my ancestors went by land, some by Trans-Siberian Railroad, and some by, by the sea. Because in... Um, Tsarist times, when they discovered that area, the Tsar wanted to move people there, so they leave, there are Russian people living and kind of protecting the Far East. So he was given free land and some other stuff. So they were like mass moving people to that area. And even by the train, it takes seven days. So I can't imagine how, what, seven or six days by train. Yeah, now. Ten days. Oh, yeah, they're much f faster now. <laughs> so now I'm thinking how much time it took my ancestors to make it all the way, and yeah, and my ancestors were Polish, Czech, Ukrainian, and Russian. So, and I think this mix in my blood affected my art later on. 
So, yeah, and y as you can see, it's very far from Moscow, but very close to Japan, China, Asia. And in when it was still um, Tsarist Russia, there were lots of, there were like Chinatown in Vladivostok, like, like something like Vancouver. There were like uh, cultural communities. But with the Soviet Union, when I was born, it was like Iron Curtain, like no, like nothing, <laughs> almost nothing went through, but you could see still some Chinese uh, sculptures or something. So they were kind of re remnants of connections. So that's, uh, that's the port city. So it's actually very s similar to Vancouver, uh, but like I mean geography, but it's very cold in winter and very hot in summer. So here we have very like leveled uh, climate, very mild. There it's like, ooh, <laughs> yeah. So, and that's when like some of my childhood memories, like I, <laughs> I remember those like, I don't know, first of May parades or some other parades where you would go and like, and you have no idea why you're there, but it's fun because I remember my dad would bring like this paper flowers like this size and you hold this red flower because red was the color of the re revolution. And, you, and people are like shouting and, and everybody's happy and you go and you like, they, how you call it, they scream out some sort of um, um, slogans about, I don't know, great Soviet Union and you just sc scream with them and you wave this red flower. So that was fun. <laughs> another, and another thing that I remember really well is that. And that, that was like <laughs> your life. You come from like say school and then your parents take you and you go to stand in the line because you need some food or some, something and you cannot just go and buy it. So, so when you go and there is not like one store where you can buy everything, yeah? So there would be a store that they would sell like some milk and meat and whatever and some other store sells like bread. And so you go through the city and you just scan where there's a line, because it's a good sign. <laughs> if there's a line, there's a cell in something. <laughs> so you jump to the end of the line. First you ask like, who's the last one? So you secure your spot. And then you ask what's out. <laughs> so <laughs> you don't ask the other way around. <laughs> yeah, and then you stay there for like hours and act, and you stay there for hours and hours and, uh, and then you, Sometimes like come to the right there and it's over like it's all ended in front of you and it's very sad <laughs> And actually my first um, ah, And another scary thing was that sometimes um, Somebody would ask can we take your child because if you there are two of you you get more of something and then you stand with some unknown woman and like, because ah. <laughs> then you get like not one piece of butter, but two pieces or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And then also it was very, uh, um, the choice is very limited. Like if it was cheese, it was cheese. I didn't know there were kinds of cheese. Yeah. So it was very kind of just one thing, <laughs> which made life kind of easy in a way, <laughs> but more boring. Yeah, and that's the hottest commodity. That's the hardest to find. <laughs> and I remember like, it's like you, if, even if you have some public bathroom, say in, at schools or university, there will be never a toilet paper there. <laughs> or even if, I can't even imagine, even if it makes it to the bathroom, it will be gone like in a second. Somebody will <laughs> just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so the good part about my childhood that I really remember well was the nature because it was all summer, almost all summers I would spend in Dacha, which is uh, like summer house with a it's like little plantation where you grow your food for winter. And, uh, and there you could go to the sea and swim. That's where I would spend all my summers just in the, you know, in the ocean. So the sea creatures were like my friends and uh, or in the forest uh, gathering mushrooms and just walking. And these, <coughs> these stripy guys sometimes were seen in the suburbs of Vladivostok. I don't know if they still wander around, but I remember in some 
uh, hungry years, they would come to snatch dogs. Yeah. Another great thing, books. <laughs> and they remember I wasn't very social child. And especially like, you know, Soviet life was, I, I found was very rigid and very um, institutional, I would say. So they would tell you like what you should think, what you should like, teachers would tell you like, whatever your own interest, your own personality doesn't matter because the collective is the most important thing. Yeah, and your own stuff, like who cares and just keep it to yourself. So you almost kind of like don't have any way to express yourself. So my f few outlets was the nature because nature won't tell you what you should be. Yeah, just absolutely neutral. You can be yourself. And then the books and the books is not just any books, but the books that offered another world, like different worlds, like all those uh, myths, all those fairy tales where everything could happen and there was like complete freedom. And you, through the books, could get into this sort of like mystical world where you can imagine you are one of the characters and so. And also, and I'm very gra grateful to my parents because they had great library. So I could just open those uh, sh like shelves and all those books were there and they collected great books on art. So I remember like a little kid, I had this like book of Picasso and it was like, oh, it was too intense for a child. But I think it, it kind of influenced me. <laughs> and, uh, and there were books on say Chinese traditional painting like Tsubashi or um, some Mayan temples. So I had all those like, it, it is like almost like a magic, like you open the book and there is this world, yeah? And some of them are made up, some of them were real, yeah? Some other cultures, other countries. So that was huge part of my, my world. So kind of outside world was a little boring and, and, and not very colorful. And then you come home and this is it. <laughs> That's where all the fun stuff happens. And then, of course, uh, the best friends were toys. And um, uh, they were not just toys to play with. With time, I was, um, so as you guessed, like art like, was my ex like, way of expressing myself since very early childhood. So these toys that were not there to play with, but also like I would copy them. So um, my relatives would bring me the wooden blanks of matryoshka, the nesting dolls, and they would copy them and they paint my own. So I had my own matryoshkas <laughs> and some wooden boxes. So first I think I, like, you know, copying masters is the part of the classical art program. So I copied my masters when I was like a child or teenager, just kind of doing this like lines of all those, you know, uh, beautiful floral motifs. So, and I th now I can see how it helped me because my hand is steady with all those miniature lines. Yeah. And those are traditional folk um, clay toys, which actually I just recently discovered that this, it's called like Dimkovsky toys. And uh, they were made in this like central part of Russia. The whole um, villages, like would uh, dig out clay and and men would make functional stuff and uh, women were making toys so they were not doing functional stuff they were almost not allowed so all these grandmothers with their grand granddaughters would sit and make toys because that was fun and not serious and you know <laughs> yeah and uh, some of these uh, locker boxes and I loved them because there was the whole story. And that's, I think, why I like painting all those stories because you could, like, in one painting without any word at all, tell the whole story. <laughs> and they're so, like, pretty and all those beautiful horses and uh, those princesses. So they all come from there. And another thing that just, like, blew my mind because imagine, like, our... <clears throat> Soviet school where for some reason the like even they were colored pencils or colored clay 
And it was never pure colors. So I was always like missing for the pure color. There was only kind of dirty and hard to find and bad quality because there is no, um, it's all so-called planned economy. So there is no competition. So if there is just one state factory that produces like colored pencils or colored clay, they have no motivation to make them nice and pretty. Yeah, they, whatever you produce, people will buy and stand in the line to get it because there's no other one. So everything was kind of like, you know, like grayish and, and classrooms were institutional and white and gray and nothing was happening. But because Vladivostok was a port city and some of my school mates, classmates, their um, dads were sailors, yeah? And they, they would still go to like Japan, whatever they did there in Soviet times. So the dads would bring them like chewing gum and some other like candies and just the, these bright wrappers would just like blow my mind. They were like, this is just so sparkly. <laughs> yeah, so these were the amazing. And sometimes you don't even get the things, you just get the wrappers. It was enough for me, like I was so happy. And also the imagery is very weird. Yeah, it's, it's not like, uh, like Russian, it's very kind of strange, abstracted and kind of attractive, but, but weird. But, and, and the next one I'll show you, that was just to die for and, and dream come true. The pencil cases. <laughs> <laughs> and I was so lucky, I don't remember how and who, but I got one of those with a beautiful, you know, like anime girl, like with the white, like uh, blonde hair and all those like sparkles and, and it was pink and just so beautiful. And they, and they put all my pencils there and they take it to school. And it was stolen the first day. I think within an hour it was gone. Oh. Yeah, but, and I still remember. I'm still looking for a similar one just to buy for myself and I think kind of restore the trauma. <laughs> so all that I'm telling you because I can see all these things now popping up in my art. And I'm like, oh, that wasn't just that. It really affected me deep inside. Okay, what's next? I don't know. Oh, so as school was super boring, but the art school was great. And the art school, we still have this kind of um, institution that art school are separate schools. They teach only art program. And you go there for four years, three times a week, three hours each day. So it's a 12 hours a week classical art program for children. And you have to pass exams to get in there. You can't just pay and go. So um, when I was 10, I think myself, I found the ad in the, in the newspaper and I asked my mom to take me to the exam place. So I went there and, they, and we had to do, the, to paint a composition, to make a drawing and, and something. So there were a few kind of things you have to do and then they get assessed and then you go through or you don't. And, um, and I went, so I passed the exams and they said, yeah, you have a spot. And then I told my mom that I'm not going to go. <laughs> and I think the teachers had to call my mom and ask them to talk to me because I took a spot. And even like it's only from 11 you can attend, but I was 10, but I still passed. So they really wanted me there. So I'm very happy that my mom talked me into, into going. And that was like the happiest four years in my life because school was prison, but after school you could go to the art school for three hours and just like do whatever you want. <laughs> and still among those classes, classical programs, so history of art, um, structural <coughs> drawing, painting, um, plein air, uh, and composition, free composition. Composition was my favorite. So it meant like no rules, do whatever you want. Yeah, like paint or draw your dreams. Because when you had to do a still life, then you cannot be as free. Like there is this damn like pot with the, with, with the fake apple. And those um, um, wax apples had teeth on them because yeah. kids would uh, <laughs> try to eat it, yeah. especially that apples, you cannot just go and buy them. Yeah, it's, they're also hard to find. So they all, I think, took chances in case this apple is re real. You can eat it. <laughs> yeah, so that was, that was a happy time. Yeah, and when I graduated high school, I, where did I go and study? 
and I go and study linguistics. And it was very painful because I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And on one hand, like I suffered through. On the other hand, that's why I speak English more or less OK, because I studied this damn <laughs> linguistics for five years at the Far Eastern State University. But there was a, again, like with school and art school, I had an, um, how you call it, um, the thing that would keep my balance. So I'm not all time sad. And that somebody uh, gave me a piece of porcelain clay because we had a porcelain factory in Vladivostok. And they made few pieces and fired them. And when I saw that this clay kind of, uh, you know, dirt looking material, then suddenly turns into this like precious white and beautiful glass looking thing. That was just mind blowing. And I asked my mom if they can figure out how I can get to the porcelain factory so I'm closer to this magical medium. And uh, I don't know wh what friends, whose friends they found, but I think my mom was uh, doing, how you call it, the uh, trade, the, to trade? So she was teaching somebody's kid English or not kid, and they let me go to the Vladivostok porcelain factory and just hang around. <laughs> and I was hanging around this Vladivostok porcelain factory for a year or more, and then later I was hanging out with, at another private porcelain factory. And this thing was huge. It's like with the capacity of 24 million pieces a year, it means 2 million pieces a month. Yeah, so I think it was supplying all, I don't know, Far East, yeah, with the porcelain ware. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where I had a chance to see how real porcelain is made. And it was so big that they would have a special building for just glazing and special building for painting. And so it was like you kind of go outside to get to another building to, you know, an, another, um, how you would call those things? Tsech? Like uh, workshop. workshop, yeah, like yeah. different workshop, yeah. I don't even know how many people would work there to produce two million pieces uh, a year. The set thing had closed down in 2008 mm -hmm. because when the uh, Soviet Union collapsed with perestroika and everything, there was so-called privatization process <laughs> where people could privatize state entities. And of course, people who had connections would, could privatize the whole factory. And then just kind of, and then it went nowhere and closed down. Also, I think with uh, open borders, you can compete with China next door, probably making that porcelain for like a fraction of the cost that would take that factory to make. But that was like also like suffering at a language school, but then when it's over, I can go to the uh, porcelain factory and just, you know, and, and enjoy myself. Yeah, and uh, so I learned, so these pieces I made um, with poor s uh, slip casting technique. So I could see how the mold, professional mold, mold makers at this factory, how they would make molds and they would ask a couple questions, just copy them uh, to the point that I learned how to do my own molds. And that actually saves me a lot now because I can, I think I save tons of money by making my own molds and as quickly as I can. And I know how to make complex molds like this horse. Maybe there are five molds for five different pieces and then I assemble them. So that's, um, uh, yeah. And some of my pieces made it to the mass production and I didn't even know. I would just suddenly see them in the store. <laughs> I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> I know this piece, I just made it. <laughs> And then they learned that they just take pieces they like and just make more, more, more molds and just like pump them out and sell them. <laughs> and I think, yeah, at, at some point, I think my dad went with me to the factory to talk to the management and they paid me something post factum <laughs> for all the using my pieces. Yeah. Okay, what's next? Ah, so, um, so when I was uh, 20, I, a very life-changing event happened in my life. My mom uh, back then uh, was working at the um, Far Eastern Academy of Sciences, and they had close relationship with the Academy of like Marine, 
whatever marine biology institute in Victoria. And they were looking to host uh, some Canadian family's kid back in Vladivostok so he can come and see the world. And uh, so my mom said, yeah, he can stay with us, but instead don't pay me, but let my child, my daughter, after that go to Victoria and spend time with you. So in, uh, what was the year? So in 1994, two months I spent in Victoria and that was just like amazing. <laughs> it was so beautiful and so wonderful that I, um, I just loved it. And what, uh, yeah, and then I come back and I'm like, how sad is that? It's not like that everywhere, but there are parts that are not pretty at all. And what I loved about Victoria was that it's not like there are like, Russia is very much about, there's, there's a parts that are super pretty and everything is nice. And then where people live, it's like, uh, and I just see in Victoria that no, people live in a beautiful place and everything <coughs> around them is beautiful. And they are in this beauty 24 seven. And I, I kind of like, I, I wouldn't <laughs> want to be like that. I don't, and I was 20 and I was so excited that I was like, I should change Russia the way it should be, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Russian people don't smile. That's me, high school student with my friend. And we went to make a photograph. Yeah, you see. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's my that's my story. That's my story. Yeah. So we went to make photograph, and the uh, the f photographer, the lady, she would tell us like, stop smiling and making a photograph, and and we were just laughing and having a good time. And she was so angry. She was trying to stop us from smiling, and she, eventually she said, I'm going out. In, I'm coming back in one minute. If you don't smile, just go out. Like, no. So, we, and we were laughing before that half an hour, so see you were sick. <laughs> so what I was doing when I was back from Victoria, I was smiling on the streets and people were like, what are you smiling at? <laughs> like, are you like nuts? Like, what do you mean? What's wrong with me or what's wrong with you? So it's actually pretty quickly taught me to just assimilate back into Russian life. <laughs> yeah. But something in me felt like, I kind of liked that way of life better. So I had these two kind of things, and you cannot not compare, yeah? You can live there and have that, or you can live here. So that was kind of, that's why I'm here eventually. Yeah, and my first job I got when I graduated from the uh, language school, I was a translator at the Far Eastern Bank for Fisheries. And they had, why would they need a translator? They had um, a international program where after perestroika all the banks tried to fit into international banking system which was different from Soviet banking system so they hired an uh, international team of consultants who would come and teach like uh, I don't know securities whatever whatever bank stuff and they worked there for more than a year and I was a good translator but that feeling that I'm living somebody else's life like how like, this is not me. And they spend there, like, I don't know, a year and a half sitting in front of the computer. And they didn't even have a ch chance to make art because I was so busy trying to learn that and be a good translator. So I would study all the time. In the end, I had this very scary feeling that very soon my life will be gone forever. It's like a train on the horizon and I'll miss it. So this, this fear, existential fear, just made me like, you know what, this is not me. Yes, I can do it. Yes, like there's guaranteed life, I have money, everything, but like I don't need this life. It doesn't make me happy. So in 2000, I moved to Moscow and I was, and that was one of those things, by the time, what, by the way, what time is it now? Time. No, <laughs> oh, okay, there's the clock. So I have to finish by seven, yeah. <laughs> So um, that was one of the, um, s um, how do you call it, um, events, like something, something hap happenings in my life that I can see that the life is, like, has plans on me and guiding me. Because I came there and I was looking for a, a job of translator because that's what I could do and that's how I could live. 
And uh, I thought, okay, I'll find the job of translator and then find some artist where I could go and ask them to talk, to teach me, or just hang around and kind of learning. And I was looking for, in the yellow pages, I was looking for the address of some of the financial institution that was hiring secretaries. And the yellow pages opened and they hire art institutions, just like, like that. <laughs> and I, like, I felt that like, this is not by accident. For me, that's a sign. And they called, there were two or three in Moscow, and they called them and they were still accepting submissions. And there were like entrance exams in two weeks and I could still make it. One, one place where I could still make it. So I called them, can I come? And they, it was like, um, first you have to pass the committee evaluation. So you have to bring your classical drawings, paintings, sculptures, portfolio, yeah? And all I had with me was like, like my dreamy stuff. And they brought it because I had nothing else, but I thought like, well, I don't risk anything. So I just show them and maybe they let me through to the exams. So part of the professors like didn't, like unless I have a professional portfolio, they didn't want to deal with me. But there was one um, woman that really liked my stuff and she really wanted me as her uh, student because she was a professor at the uh, sculpture department. So she, uh, Hey, come in. <laughs> Thank you for coming. So, um, so she talked them into letting me through to the exams so I can, I can take my chances. And then she went out and she told me, you know what, you have two weeks to prepare. There are students who want to, uh, or like not students, before they become students, what's the word? Uh, applicants, they hire model and they practice. So go with them. And so I went where they were practicing and they entered this room and it's like kind of, you know, like sculptors, uh, if you've ever seen sculptor studio, it's all like, like dirt and, and, and rusty metal. It's not like nice. And there's this like real like naked model stay, staying on the stand in the middle of the room. And I was like shaking because this is, I can't believe it. I'm here, like this is real artists do. That's what, and I always kind of like, I'm not real artist. Yeah, I'm just hanging around real artists. And so I didn't even care if I enter, if I pass the exams or don't, but just the chance for two weeks, pretend I'm a real artist, you know, a real art student and be in this room and work from life model was just so amazing. And they had like such a great time that I got at the entrance exams, we had to make um, figure, sculpture, portrait, a classical drawing and something else. And they got second best result. Mm -hmm. And they think I got it just because I was so, I was intense. I was so relaxed that everything I could show kind of showed there. I look now at my like first works, I'm like, how they even let me through? <laughs> but probably they felt like saw something in me. So I'm very grateful that for the opportunity to finally get it, get there. Yeah, and the that was uh, my group with my professors. So you can see, yeah, that's the sculpting like background. <laughs> that's not very like kind of nice and colorful, but sculpt I always was always into sculpture. So that was like just my heaven. Yeah, and we did classical programs. So life size or more than a life size, small size, human figure, relief, which is like be behind me. Um, what else did we do? That's my first year summer program, the an animalistic sculpture. Um, then we had to work with uh, stone. Yeah, and that was like, that was my life, finally. And then uh, the good thing, another good thing about it, because I did lots of commissions. And so, and commissions were like, do a piece in this style or that style. And then you just, this, that's like Art Nouveau, but I made up this composition, so it's not a copy, but I tried to fit in this uh, style features and like know how, it, what, how should it make this figure look so it fits into this era. So those I made, I think there were like 13 different reliefs. So it was a good, um, and that was a copy of uh, a Syrian uh, lion hunt. So 
so hard to see, but there is like, uh, then I had to copy all this uh, uh, stone carvings of, uh, you know, 2,000 year old reliefs or 3,000 <laughs> year old. So that was all, that was a copy of um, um, Soviet realism. I think it was a relief for the um, uh, agriculture, Minister of Agriculture in Moscow. So that was a great school of like sculpting of art, a skill and, and knowledge, yeah. So, and in 2008, we immigrated with my um, husband at the time and my daughter, she was less than three. We immigrated to Canada and that was a decision based on all those experiences where I could see like my li I could envision my life here in Russia or my life there in Canada. And for me, um, just live in a place that is more relaxed, there is more freedom and there is more um, chances to be yourself. So that was, uh, that's why we did that. And since I landed, I just felt this is my place, like this is my place, like I belong here. So there was feeling I never had in Russia because it will, I will, was always like against flow there. <laughs> I would drive and they would observe the rules. And since nobody else observing the rules, I'm always against the flow. Mm -hmm. So it was like, <laughs> and here I'm like, oh, everybody observes the rules. That's good, <laughs> almost, almost everybody. <laughs> and then I could see, like I would make, for me making art is not based on thinking or intellectual, um, I call it like idea, but it's more like intuitive. And, some, and, and then I could see that this kind of pieces that I make about like everything, they kind of actually could be uh, formed into series. So, and this series about Minotaur, it was just one year I was just making Minotaurs. I don't know, they just came and I cannot stop it. So you just kind of let them go through. And they were uh, sculpt, this is a soapstone carving. So they were sculptures, paintings, uh, drawings about Minotaurs and, uh, and and more, many of them were like, I would make a piece and I'm like, oh, I love it so much. And then second later, I'm like, well, that's kind of Picasso. <laughs> and that's kind of somebody else and somebody else. And I understand that that's part of growth, artistical growth. You have to go through all those big, um, and it's not that they're big names, but they discovered something. And unless you make those discoveries your own, you cannot really move further. further. And it's kind of scary because you think, oh, am I just a copyist by nature? Or it will lead me to myself in the end. So it's just like your faith that you hope that in the end, you'll find your own language. But um, no, um, how do I call it? Nothing can confirm <laughs> that it's right. Another, another, the whole body of work is about this girl with bunny ears. Like I call her Miss Bunny. I don't know what she m means. Some, I, I think for me, uh, maybe she is the uh, archetype of a female without any uh, racial, cultural, age, whatever connotation. So it's just like a female entity. So I think she's, uh, she's that. And I, um, that's uh, if you recognize Lynette. <laughs> what it was a couple years ago? Yeah, a year ago? Yeah. Yeah, that's your school. I got a residency at the uh, St. George's uh, Boys School. Mm -hmm. And they decided to make another bunny, but in clay. So that's like a process. I had a mold, so you press clay in the mold. And then uh, I would paint it with underglazes and fire it. And then I would uh, draw the um, silver pen to add this kind of another layer of, you know, silver lining. and. And these eyelashes I bought, you know, I buy when there is a Halloween time, they sell all these weird eyelashes and they just collect them because I might use them later. Yeah. And uh, so that's, uh, I wonder if it would play. Yeah, so that's, uh, so this piece now is uh, displayed at the Vancouver International Airport. Uh, I am not very sure where exactly, and I think they also move pieces around, but, uh, and it's in the international zone, so you have to pass through customs, but if you travel somewhere, so she's there. Another, this, I 
I think is my signature piece, molecular bears, mole bears, because the, these are the molecules of teddy barium. <laughs> and that's uh, the, uh, and that's a uh, childhood joy matter. And I wanna make my own, well, not make my own, I wanna add uh, and, um, my own element to the periodical table. So teddy barium is among other elements. <laughs> Yeah, and these guys they make in different sizes. These are bigger ones, like 14 inches high, tall. And these guys are porcelain, slip cast porcelain. They are like little baby uh, mo bears. And they also have the mini mo bears. So, mm -hmm. and, and actually I wanna go now the other direction and make them like public art, like huge, happy, shiny pieces in the uh, urban environment, but because I think the shape really will um, work well with the urban um, geometry, but it, they will be happy. There won't be some boring piece of art. There will be a piece of art that will make people happy because it's a molecule of childhood joy. Yeah, and then uh, I, uh, at some point, I thought that all my little porcelain things should be somehow combined into like almost like a s special brand, which is a Anuta porcelain. So these are my p sculptures of functional pieces that are made by slip casting. And they usually are limited editions and I number them and I sign them so they still have the value, but they are not one of a kind. They're like, so more people can afford it, but still limited. So it's, it's, uh, it has a certain value. And how I make them, I make my own molds, as you can see here, then I pour liquid clay, porcelain clay into the mold and then I, on the uh, right, that's after I pour it out. So the plaster absorbs some uh, clay along the edges. And then I open it and that's a uh, porcelain cast inside. And then I fire them in the kiln. They go through a few firings. And then I um, paint them with glazes or under glazes and fire them again. That's how they get their beautiful look. And all this love for porcelain comes from the porcelain factory. Yeah, that's a mother and child little piece. Um, that's um, the deer skull series, which uh, were originated from um, when my friends brought me a deer skull to my studio, and it was so beautiful that I was just playing with different like interpretations. So I have few sizes of these deer skulls. And sometimes like I add by hand, add some elements, so make them one of a kind, like uh, special pieces. And I also do some jewelry. This minimal bear on the right is made into a pendant, a necklace, and that's a seashell baby, and that's from my love to all the ocean life. Yeah, that's Matryoshka doll made into a vase. And the uh, Japanese doll vase, that's from my, from my love to J weird Japanese stuff. Yeah, and these are little um, squirrel bud vases. <laughs> and all, this, all the vases, everything that sounds functional and looks functional is totally functional. So they're glazed and you can pour water. And these guys, um, this my bears. I just wanted to make something very cute. And, like, and, and when I made this cute one on the right, I thought, well, I want to be like this bear. So I made them into... Uh, mirror so when you look at it like you're the bear like you have these ears and you smile and your day is very nice and bright and these are the latest ones these are um, little jewelry boxes so i have a cat i have a mouse and i have a bunny mm. yeah and i have now this stamp like <laughs> it's a de de decals 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 yeah and they even like use this technique um, to create a Canadian legend award. I, um, um, in 2017, there was an open call, like a design challenge, and I made a, uh, um, like a sketch, three-dimensional sketch, and it won the uh, commission. So, and then it was funny, they gave me one month to do everything from just the sketch to the finished piece because they cannot move the uh, inauguration or whatever the uh, David Foster was coming to Victoria to this Col Canadian College of Performing Arts. And I, and I, was, I spent this month at Dan's, I think, uh, kitchen just 
from stress, I was it had ice bucket of ice cream in one hand, <laughs> and there was and I just just sculpting the sculpting and like to find the proper look, see how much time it takes, and then I had to make a mold and make a test firing, and 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 I'm just thinking they are even worse than us artists. They are actors. They go on the stage, they perform. This is it. And, and they probably don't realize how much uh, material and, and technical steps are in make, making a piece. So, <laughs> yeah, and also try different materials, which is, uh, this is a welded uh, metal in in, in, inside. It's like welded uh, ro metal rods. And then uh, I mix paper with a, a, a gypsum, like drywall compound and white glue. So it's super strong. So if this, this guy, this girl, gazelle girl, she's eight feet tall. So this kind of material is good for something skinny, so it doesn't break, and very like, and large. Another piece that is in the show, the same material. So the spirals, making them in clay would be just too dangerous. And then princesses, so some of them you'll see at the show tonight. And they just came. And you kind of, you don't argue. Whatever, um, whatever images, visuals you come, you just, make them. Um, and that's a bunny princess. She's in the show too with little bunny. And they say, oh, that's her pet. And then they think, no, that's her child. That's creepy. <laughs> <laughs> and then I this, again at the uh, school, I was uh, at the residency at St. George's School. I was, well, Lynette is, is still a technician. So thank you for helping me with all that. So I was making this uh, ice cream princess because I thought, well, it's an abstracted kind of princessy form, but it looks like ice cream. So we called her ice cream princess. And that's in your kiln. That's her in your kiln. And then when she was fired, I decided to decorate her with the Swarovski crystals. And I think I counted. And after 2000, I just lost count. And I'm like, well, there is more than 2000 Swarovski crystals in this one. And she is in the show. And the moment I finished her, I realized that's Fabergé eggs. That's my cultural background coming through without me even realizing that only after I finished her. And there are more princesses with horses now. And some princesses with horses, uh, kind of, they, they kind of go from painting to drawing to ceramics to sculpture and back. So that's kind of like the same. There, that, there's an, Small horses, and they're even smaller horses. These have like amazonite beads on it, so it's almost like, almost like emergent jewelry with with full craft, with everything, with like classical art, and I, I really like the result. Okay, there is a, another horse, which is a porcelain horse, but it cracked in so many places, I couldn't use glazes, so I just used a, a, a acrylic paint to make the finish, and it still looks nice. And then uh, last year, I won a two-year residency in Seattle with Pottery Northwest. It's a huge ceramic mm -hmm. studios and community, and I absolutely found my own tribe there. So I just love it. So now I'm shuttling between Vancouver and uh, Seattle. Yeah, and that's, uh, uh, that's the first piece I start, made there uh, is this clay uh, that I clay started, horse um, okay, it's too slow my new artist. that's okay i'll just show you the uh, end result so that's a sugar horse and i thought like these things look like ice cream or some you know melting ice cream and you can see the russian dimkovsky toy like, <laughs> like i'm making toys i'm still making toys and that's a close-up and that's a little uh, titanium unicorn <laughs> This one, I use Swarovski crystals just for eyes, and I'm like, that's enough. <laughs> so close up. And then I thought I'm going to make a big horse. So I make a big sketch, and I kind of cut it into pieces. So they were almost like when you sew, how you call those pieces? Patterns. patterns, yeah. So I use patterns to build this guy, and eventually to made it into my biggest horse so far. And it will be, again, you'll see it at the uh, show tonight. And this is a seahorse, which is like, I don't know what it is. It's kind of seahorse and horse and, and, and seaweed and just just like some formal formal experiment. And they like those, pe you know, I 
sometimes I cannot even buy art materials in real art stores like Opus because they sell serious art materials. So I have to go to craft stores where they sell glitter for children. And that's pink glitter on these little main things. And so what I'm working on now, that's kind of like almost the end of the uh, presentation. So I'm just telling you what's happening right now. And then want to make some sculptures that I almost see like public art, like big, large scale, some, something horsey and princessy and uh, like nature and human. So I'm making lots of sketches. And I made the sketch of uh, this girl and I started, and that's kind of example how it often happens in art. So I, I had this idea, so that's what I'm gonna make. And I started with the torso, so I made like a, a, a middle part, so I have something to stick clay to, and made it from um, tin foil, and then uh, wrap it with um, tape, yeah. And then I made this, this girl, and then I just cut it open, took this middle part away, and they put it together, so it's hollow inside. And then when I made her, I'm like, I don't see her with this crazy hair. Like, I don't see her. I like her with very, like, you know, tight uh, head. And then I was thinking, I should make her into the uh, Athena, because that's all my stories that's inside me, like all those myths. Because Athena, like, you, you, cannot, you can avoid um, the, uh, you can avoid hair, but it's still kind of this head, the helmet could, could be um, like this decorative part. So now I'm making her into uh, Athena with helmet, with a griffin. And that's my idea that I'll just add uh, wings made of paper mache that I can make because it will be very light. And then some sort of feathers of some fluffy uh, plumage. And this plumage will kind of finish the whole piece. So that's like from my idea with girls with curls, now that I have Athena. And I thought, oh, I like this idea of these goddesses and some kind of, because there's so much story already there. I don't have to make it up. And then I made this painting. This is Diana the Huntress, the goddess of all like wildlife and nature and hunt and everything. And I'm thinking, well, I make a painting, but she will be a sculpture because then I can put the beautiful deer skull as, as part of her hair do. So, so I think that's, yeah, this is it. So that's um, where I'm at. <laughs> Thank you.